The references for this section include EM 385-1-1 section 16, 29 CFR 1926.551 through 554 subpart N, 29 CFR 1926.1400 through 1442 subpart CC, and Uniform Facilities Guide Specifications, or UFGS 01-3526. Cranes are complex machines which require specialized training in order to operate and maintain them correctly and efficiently. Although most cranes in like categories have common characteristics, they tend to have unique and sometimes subtle differences which, if not understood and followed, will lead to a crane incident. Cranes are involved in 25 to 33 percent of fatal injuries in construction and maintenance. Electrocution by power line contact was the most common type of incident. This section is applicable to all load handling equipment, or LHE, to include cranes, derricks, hoists, and power operated equipment that can be used to hoist, lower, and or horizontally move a suspended load. The principal load handling equipment mishaps occur from overloading, struck by, and electrocution. Hydraulic excavators, wheeled, track hoe, or back hoe loaders used to hoist loads with rigging, also referred to as multi-purpose machines, are exempt from crane operator certification requirements. Powered industrial trucks, PITs, for example forklifts or telehandlers, when configured to hoist and lower, by means of a winch or hook, and horizontally move a suspended or rigged load are exempt from requirements in 16.B.02 through 16.B.05 crane operator certifications. Note, only unless this equipment is used to hoist or lift personnel. This activity is considered a critical lift and as such, requires a physical examination for the operator per 16.B.05 and additional training per section 16.Q. Rigor qualifications still apply per section 15.B. See 16.Q for equipment specific requirements. Exemptions from these requirements include material delivery, articulating or knuckle boom truck load handling equipment that delivers material or materials to a construction site when used to transfer materials from the truck crane to the ground without arranging the materials in a particular sequence for hoisting. Articulating or knuckle boom truck load handling equipment that delivers materials to a construction site when the crane is used to transfer building supply sheet goods or building supply packaged materials from the truck crane onto a structure using a fork or cradle at the end of the boom, but only when the truck crane is equipped with a properly functioning automatic overload prevention device. Also exempt are such sheet goods or packaged materials that include, but are not limited to, sheets of sheetrock, sheets of plywood, bags of cement, sheets or packages of roofing shingles, and rolls of roofing felt. The aforementioned exclusions do not apply when the articulating or knuckle boom crane is used to hold, support, or stabilize the material to facilitate a construction activity, such as holding material in place while it is attached to the structure. The material being handled by the articulating or knuckle boom crane 
is a prefabricated component. Such prefabricated components include, but are not limited to, precast concrete members or panels, roof trusses, wooden, cold form metal, steel, or other material, prefabricated building sections such as, but not limited to, floor panels, wall panels, roof panels, roof structures, or similar items, or the material being handled by the crane as a structural steel member, for example, steel joists, beams, columns, steel decking, bundled or unbundled, or a component of a systems engineered metal building. Contractors shall submit a certificate of compliance for each piece of load handling equipment prior to being brought on site. The certificate of compliance shall be submitted to the government designated authority for acceptance. The certificate of compliance states that the load handling equipment and the rigging equipment meets applicable regulations to include inspections and tests as required by the manufacturers and the requirements of this manual. It must be signed by a competent person for crane and rigging. Included in a standard lift plan are things such as that all lifts must be planned to avoid procedures that could result in configurations where the operator cannot maintain safe control of the lift. A written standard lift plan shall be prepared for every lift or series of lifts if the duty cycle or routine lifts are being performed. The SLP shall be developed, reviewed, and accepted by all personnel involved in the lift. At a minimum, the following shall be addressed or use the non-mandatory standard pre-lift plan or checklist shown in Form 16-1. Note, from this point forward, lift plans are required. Note also that a plan could be developed for a series of lifts. You are now documenting what you have already been doing. Checklist indicates the standard pre-lift crane plan checklist shown in Form 16-2 of the 2014 edition of the EM385. For pre-use inspections, those should be conducted before any crane or hoisting equipment is initially installed or placed on any government facility or project site for the first time. It shall be inspected and tested and certified in writing by a competent person. Contractors shall submit a certificate of compliance for each piece of load handling equipment prior to being brought on site. The certificate of compliance shall be posted on the load handling equipment. The employer shall comply with all manufacturer's instructions, procedures, and recommendations and shall apply if more stringent than EM385. Safe operating speeds or loads shall not be exceeded. The employer shall develop and ensure compliance with all procedures necessary for the safe operation of the equipment and attachments when they are not available. The use of electronic equipment for entertainment purposes while operating equipment is prohibited. The equipment shall be shut down before and during fueling operations. Inspections or determinations of rolled and shoulder conditions and structures shall be made in advance. Load handling equipment shall be provided with the following. Seats or equal protection must be provided safety glass windshields, windows, and doors, and a minimum of one dry chemical or CO2 fire extinguisher. Equipment requirements also include guarding for moving parts and safety devices that shall be provided, used, and maintained. Also, platforms and walkways shall be designed, constructed, and installed 
on machinery and equipment to provide safe footing and access ways. As you can see from the picture, there is an example of an unguarded chain drive. Additionally, the platform demonstrates one of the horizontal walking surfaces. Additionally, the platform shows an example of a safe footing and access way to the load handling equipment. Additionally, the platform shown in the picture indicates an example of safe footing and access way. The following apply to load handling work zones. It includes an area 360 degrees around the crane's maximum working radius, shall be barricaded to prevent an employee from being struck or crushed, and a 24 inch minimum clearance shall be provided between moving and rotating parts and fixed objects. For load handling equipment maintenance and repairs, it shall be performed in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. It shall be made available to the government designated authority upon request, shall shut down prior to maintenance or repair, and positive means shall be taken to prevent operation during the maintenance process. New in the 2014 edition, Load handling equipment maintenance and repairs must consider control of hazardous energy, lockout or tagout during the maintenance and repair of equipment. Also new in the 2014 edition, load handling equipment maintenance and repairs must identify load handling equipment hazardous energy control program and specific isolation procedures in the activity hazard analysis. During load handling equipment parking, the parking brake shall be set, the wheels shall be chalked or track mechanisms blocked, and the parking brake set when parked on an incline. The load handling equipment shall have lights or reflectors or barricades equipped with lights or reflectors to identify the location of the equipment when left unattended at night, adjacent to a highway in normal use, or adjacent to construction areas where work is in progress. Trainees must be under the direct supervision of the designated operator of the crane or hoist. Load handling equipment maintenance, inspection, and repair personnel are permitted to operate the equipment only where the following requirements are met. The operation is limited to those functions necessary to perform maintenance, inspect the equipment, or verify its performance. Additionally, lifting of loads by these personnel is not allowed and they must either operate the equipment under the direct supervision of a qualified operator, see section 16.B.02, or must read and review the operator's manual so that they are familiar with the operations, limitations, characteristics, and hazards associated with the load handling equipment being inspected, maintained, or repaired. Load handling equipment maintenance, inspection, and repair personnel covered by this section are exempt from the crane operator physical requirements identified in paragraph 16.B.05. Certification for all crane and hoist operators shall be achieved by successful completion of written and operational testing. Qualification of all crane and hoist operators shall be made by the employer after a review of the certification documents and an assurance that the operator or operators are familiar with the equipment to be operated and has adequate knowledge of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, crane safety requirements, and manufacturer recommendations provided in the crane operator's manual. The employer then designates the operator or operators in writing for the equipment to be operated in accordance with one of the referenced options. Option 1. 
current certification by a nationally accredited crane operator testing organization. The operator certificate must identify the type of equipment on which the operator was certified. Once the operator has obtained the certification, the employer must ensure that the operator is qualified to operate a particular piece of equipment for that type and capacity and must designate this in writing. For option one, a current certification by an accredited nationally recognized crane or derrick operator testing organization. Certification under option one would be portable, which means that an employer covered by the proposed standard could meet the requirements of proposed section 1926.1427 by using an operator who has this certification. These certifications would be valid for five years. Here provides an example of the CCO certification card. Important to note, certification cards are only valid in conjunction with the current Department of Transportation or medical certificate. You must also verify certification is current in the appropriate crane categories. Check the card for any irregularities. Never accept a photocopy of a card as proof of certification. And contact the licensing agency should you have any doubts. All crane and derrick operators shall be physically qualified to operate the equipment. Physical examinations for operators are required to be conducted every two years and any time a condition is observed that may impact safe operation. Written proof signed by a physician, this term is intended to mean a medical doctor or MD or doctor of osteopathy, DO, stating that the operator has had a physical examination and meets the medical requirements set forth below shall be submitted to the GDA for acceptance prior to allowing an operator to operate the equipment. Crane operators shall have a current physician's certification dated within the past two years that states the operator meets the following physical qualifications. Vision of at least 2030 Snellen in one eye and 2050 in the other with or without corrective lenses, normal depth perception and field of vision, ability to distinguish colors regardless of position, adequate hearing with or without hearing aid for the specific operation. The current physician certification must also state that the operator meets the following physical qualifications, sufficient strength, endurance, agility, coordination, manual dexterity, and speed of reaction to meet the demands of equipment operation. No evidence that the operator is subject to seizures or loss of physical control. If evidence of this nature is found, it may be sufficient cause for disqualification. In such cases, specialized medical tests may be required to evaluate these conditions and determine their impact and no evidence of physical defects or emotional instability that could render a hazard to the operator or that in the opinion of the examiner could interfere with the operator's performance. If evidence of this nature is found, it may be sufficient cause for disqualification. Specialized medical tests may be required to determine these conditions. The following are deviations from physical qualification requirements. For an operator who has previously established qualifications to operate, deviations from the physical requirements are not necessarily totally disqualifying. Where such deviations exist, competent medical and management authorities shall give special consideration to each individual case and may recommend waivers. Waivers may be approved by the local Safety and Occupational Health Office and a copy provided to the headquarters Safety and Occupational Health Office. Normally, waivers shall not be granted for applicants who have never before established operator qualifications. Any limitations imposed by reason of physical defects shall be noted on the operator's license and license record. Also, the individual must also participate in a drug testing program and have a negative result. 
for contractor operated drug testing programs, all contractor crane operators shall participate in a drug testing program and have a negative result for a substance abuse test. The level of testing will be in accordance with standard practices for industry or by the agency's random drug testing program. This test will be confirmed by a recognized laboratory service. Government operated drug testing program requires all government Department of Defense crane operators as identified below to participate in a drug testing program and have a negative result for a substance abuse test per AR 600-85 paragraph 5-815. In addition, if an employee is in any other specified test designated position or TDP in this AR 600-85, he or she must be tested accordingly. The level of testing shall be in accordance with the agency's testing program. This test will be confirmed by a recognized laboratory service. For crane operator qualifications and certifications, class one training must be initially a minimum of 24 hours of training with successful completion or past written and practical or operational examination. Biennially, every 24 months, refresher, a minimum of eight hour refresher training with successful completion or pass of written and practical operational examination. Note, while a grace period is permitted, refresher training is intended to be obtained every 24 months. Understanding that emergencies and other unplanned events can occur that may interrupt the normal scheduling of this training, a 60-day grace period is permitted if necessary and is dependent upon supervisory approval. Note 2. Exception of equipment with a maximum manufacturer rated hoisting or lifting capacity of 2,000 pounds or less, exempt from the requirements of 16.B.02 through 16.B.06 only, shall see paragraph 16.A.01.H. It is anticipated that operators of this equipment will review manufacturer's instructions for proper operation. This equipment shall not be used for hoisting personnel. Note 3. Operators of Class 2 load handling or hoisting equipment are exempt from 16.B.05 physical examination requirements unless this equipment is used to hoist or lift personnel. See also section 16.A.01.I, section 16.B.05, and section 16.U. This activity is considered a critical lift and requires a physical examination for the operator. In addition, all class two operators that will be hoisting personnel shall be trained at a minimum and the requirements listed in section 16.T, 16.U, or other applicable equipment related sections. See also section 16.C.01, note 2, and section 16.U. Prior to operating a crane, the employer must ensure the operator is certified, qualified, and designated in writing to operate the equipment in accordance with one of the following options. Option one, accredited testing organization. The operator's certificate must identify the type of equipment on which the operator was certified. Once the operator has obtained the certification, the employer must ensure that the operator is qualified to operate a particular piece of equipment for that type and capacity and must designate this in writing. Signal person qualifications require that the signal person be qualified by a third party or employer's qualified evaluator. The evaluator documentation specifies the types of signaling. 
signal persons must successfully complete or pass any written or operational examination in order to perform signal work. Evaluators that assess signal persons must ensure that they know and understand standard methods for hand signals, are competent in the application, understand crane dynamics, and pass a written and practical test. The employer's assessment is not portable. The following are inspection criteria for load handling equipment. Inspections of load handling equipment shall be in accordance with this section, applicable ASME standards, OSHA regulations, and the manufacturer's recommendations. Records of all load handling equipment tests and inspections shall be maintained on site. Contractors shall make these records readily available upon request and when submitted, they shall become part of the official project file. Wire rope inspection, maintenance, and replacement. During each shift, a competent person shall perform this inspection by visually inspecting all running ropes, counterweight ropes, and load and trolley or standing ropes. Visual inspection shall concentrate on identifying apparent deficiencies in wire rope, both running and standing, as characterized in the wire rope inspection checklist that is located in Appendix I. Opening of wire rope or booming down is not required as part of this inspection. Annually, at least every 12 months, wire ropes, both running and standing, in use on equipment must be inspected by a qualified person in accordance with the annual wire rope inspection checklist that is located in Appendix I. The following explain safety devices and operational aids for operating load handling equipment. Safety devices and operational aids shall not be used as a substitute for the exercise of professional judgment of the operator. The following safety devices are required on all cranes and derricks covered by Section 16 unless otherwise specified. Crane level indicators, boom stops, except for derricks and hydraulic cranes, and jib stops if the jib is attached. The following safety devices are also required on all cranes and derricks covered by Section 16 unless otherwise specified. If equipped with a foot pedal brake, shall have locks, except portal or floating cranes. Hydraulic outrigger jacks shall have internal holding devices, or check valve. Equipment on rails shall have rail clamps and rail stops, except for portal cranes. And they must also be equipped with a horn. Some example of an operational safety device are a limit switch, an anti-tube lock device, and a horn. Operations shall not begin unless the safety devices listed above are in proper working order. If a safety device stops working properly during operations, the operator shall safely stop operations. Operations shall not resume until the device is again working properly. Alternative measures are not permitted to be used. An example of an operational aid include boom angle indicator and drum rotate indicator. Operations shall not begin unless the listed operational aids are in proper working order except where the employer meets the specified temporary alternative measures. More protective alternative measures specified by the crane manufacturer, if any, shall be followed. If a listed operational aid stops working properly during operations, the operator shall safely stop operations until the temporary alternative measures are implemented or the device is again working properly. If a replacement part is no longer available, the use of a substitute device that performs the same type of function is permitted 
and is not considered a modification. The following are Category 1 Operational Aids in Alternative Measures. Operational aids listed in this paragraph that are not working properly shall be repaired not later than seven days after the deficiency occurs. All loads shall be determined through one of the following methods. This information must be known or provided to the operator prior to the lift. Load weighing device, load moment or rated capacity indicator, load moment or rated capacity limiter, or the weight of the load must be determined either from a source recognized by the industry, such as the load manufacturer, or by a calculation method recognized by the industry. For example, calculating a steel beam from measured dimensions and a known per foot weight as determined by a qualified rigger. Operator testing for load handling equipment shall include written reports of tests showing that test procedures and confirming the adequacy of repairs or alterations shall be maintained with the crane and hoisting equipment or at the on-site project office. Load handling equipment shall have the following documents with them in the cab, if applicable, at all times that they are operated. A copy of the manufacturer's operating manual, load rating chart, durable load chart, crane log book, all inspections, tests, maintenance, and repairs, and all inspections, tests, maintenance, and repairs for hoisting equipment. A qualified person shall conduct operational tests in accordance with ANSI and ASME and the manufacturer's recommendations. If the manufacturer has no procedures, the requirements in this section, as a minimum, must be performed. Before initial use of a crane or hoisting equipment, after a load bearing or load controlling part or component, brake, travel component, or clutch, to include securing devices, skids, and barges for floating load handling equipment, has been altered, replaced, or repaired. Every time a crane or hoisting equipment is reconfigured or reassembled after disassembly, to include booms. Additionally, if the manufacturer has no procedures, the following requirements, as a minimum, must be performed. Every time a crane and or hoisting equipment is brought onto a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project and every year during periodic inspection. Complete operational testing of the equipment after the replacement of wire rope is not required. However, a limited operational test including actions 16.F.02.D1 and D2 below under a normal operating load shall be made prior to putting the equipment back in service. Load testing shall be considered a critical lift. Also, before initial use, after a load bearing or load controlling part or component brake, travel component, or clutch has been altered, replaced, or repaired, and when the manufacturer requires load testing. It shall be performed at 100 to 110 percent of anticipated load for the specified configuration, not to exceed 100 percent of the manufacturer's structural load rating chart. All cranes and derricks shall be equipped with an anti-tube lock or hoist limit device that will disengage the function that is causing the tube locking or an anti-tube lock damage prevention feature. The following show a couple of examples of where anti-tube block devices can be installed. As an exception to anti-tube blocking, lattice boom cranes that are used exclusively for duty cycle operations are exempt from anti-two block equipment requirements. Operational aids include wind speed indicating devices that are mounted on the crane. 
Additionally, an operational aid can include a load moment indicator, where the operator enters input into the load moment indicator configuration of crane weight, rigging, block counterweights, etc. The load moment indicator is to be verified with the crane load rating as the crane is set up. Standard signal systems shall be used on all cranes and hoisting equipment by hand, voice, audible, or comparable signals. The following table shows an example of some of the most common hand signals, including hoist, lower, bridge travel, trolley travel, stop, emergency stop, multiple trolleys, move slowly, and when the magnet is disconnected. Before assembling or disassembling equipment, the employer must determine if any part of the equipment, load line, or load, including rigging and lifting accessories, could get closer than 20 feet or 6 meters to a power line during this process. The following is an example of a typical electrical hazard warning placard that highlights the electrocution hazard and warns the operator and those nearby not to contact power lines with any part of the crane or load. There is specific training for employees to work near power lines. The training required includes that each operator and crew member assigned to work with the equipment shall have received the following training by a qualified person. The procedures to follow in the event there is contact with the power line, information regarding the danger of electrocution from the operator simultaneously touching the equipment and the ground, the importance to the operator's safety of remaining inside the cab except where there is an imminent danger of fire, explosion, or other emergency that necessitates leaving the cab, and the safest means of evacuating load handling equipment that may be energized. Additionally, each operator and crew member assigned to work with the equipment shall also receive the following training by a qualified person, highlighting the danger of the potentially energized zone around the load handling equipment, the need for crew in the area to avoid approaching or touching the load handling equipment and the load, safe clearance distance from the power line. Power lines are presumed to be energized unless the utility owner and operator confirms that the power line is de-energized and visibly grounded. Additionally, each operator and crew member assigned to work with the equipment shall have received the following training by a qualified person. That power lines are presumed to be uninsulated unless the utility owner and operator or a registered professional engineer who is a qualified person confirms that the line is insulated. The limitations of an insulating link or device proximity alarm, and range control or similar device if used, and equipment grounding procedures and the limitations thereof. For power line clearances, refer to tables 16-1 and 16-2, pre-plan travel routes to identify hazards and take necessary precautions, take added steps when traveling at night or in conditions of poor visibility, Never handle power lines unless properly trained and authorized. Electricity can arc from the power line or source to a moving or stationary object. And never assume the power line is de-energized. Each operator and crew member assigned to work with the equipment shall have received the following training. All of the following are required to be covered during the training. Procedures if contact with power lines. Operator electrocution from equipment and ground contact. Importance of staying in the cab. Safe means of evacuation from energized cab. Potentially energized zone dangers. Crew avoidance on approach and touch. Safe clearance distance from power lines. The assumption that power lines are energized the assumption that power lines are uninsulated, limitations of insulating links and devices, grounding procedures and limitations, dedicated spotters trained effectively. 
The following details highlight a fatality that occurred during operation of load handling equipment. Two plumbers working in a trench were being hoisted to the street level in the bucket of an excavator. As the excavator operator started to swing the bucket, it jerked, causing one of the employees to fall approximately 14 feet, striking his head on the pipe in the trench. Personnel shall not work in, pass under, or ride in the buckets or booms of loaders in operation. The following, as a minimum, are considered critical lifts. Hoisting personnel, lifts involving more than one crane, lifts where the center of gravity could change, lifts the crane operator considers critical, lifts where the load weight is 75% of the rated capacity of the crane load chart. The following are also considered critical lifts. Lifts involving no outriggers or rubber tire load charts, lifts involving more than one hoist on the same crane or trolley, non-routine or technically difficult rigging arrangement to include lifts involving multiple lift rigging, submerged loads, lifts of loads out of operator's view, load tests, and when land cranes or derricks mounted on barges, pontoons, or other means of flotation are required to travel while lifting the load. The following actions shall be taken into consideration to address potential environmental hazards. Load handling equipment shall not be operated when wind speeds at the site attain the maximum wind velocity. All operations shall cease when the wind speeds are greater than 20 miles per hour. The competent person shall determine if a local storm warning merits securing the equipment. Reduce functional speeds during the presence of icing or low visibility. Cease operations for a 30 minute period after lightning observation. Provide adequate illumination for night operations. When lightning is observed, all load handling equipment operations shall stop. A determination shall be made as to the proximity to operations being performed. Use a lightning detector or once lightning is seen, count the number of seconds until you hear thunder. Divide the number of seconds by five to get the distance the lightning is away from you in miles. If lightning is 10 miles away or less, work must stop until 10 minutes after the last audible thunder or visible flash of lightning. Plan work activities according to the latest weather forecast and be prepared to stop operations until bad weather has safely passed. These actions shall be documented in the daily report, crane operator's logbook, etc. For lattice, hydraulic, crawler, truck, wheel, and rigger mounted cranes, blocking, cribbing, and other means of securing shall be confirmed, verified, and approved by a competent person before assembly and disassembly operations are allowed to proceed. When outrigger floats are used, they shall be securely attached to the outriggers. Blocking under outrigger floats shall meet the following requirements. Shall be of sufficient strength to prevent crushing, bending, or shear failure. Such thickness, width, and length as to completely support the float, transmit the load to the supporting surface, and prevent shifting, toppling, or excessive settlement under load. The blocking shall be a minimum of four times greater than the area of the manufacturer's float, which can be figured using this equation, where the area, measured in square feet, is equal to the crane capacity in tons divided by five. Anytime outriggers are required to be used, they shall be extended or deployed per the crane manufacturer's load and capacity chart specifications and set to remove the machine weight from the wheels at all settings, except for locomotive cranes. These images provide an indication of both blocking and outrigger float. Outriggers shall be on stable and firm ground, and from visual observation of this image, it is unclear as to whether those outriggers meet that requirement. Wheels shall be off the ground. 
portal, tower, and pillar cranes shall be located such that no crane may come in contact with the structure of another crane. Cranes are permitted to pass over one another. For portal, tower, and pillar cranes, pre-operational tests shall be performed when the cranes are erected and after each climbing operation before placing the crane in service. All functional motions, motion limiting devices, and brakes shall be properly tested for operation in accordance with the manufacturer's recommended procedures in ANSI ASME B30.3 or B30.4 as applicable and shall include the crane supports, brakes and clutches, limit and overload switches, and locking safety devices, and load hoisting and lowering, boom hoisting and lowering, and swing motion mechanisms and procedures. Portal, tower, and pillar crane climbing procedures shall include the following. Both prior to and during all climbing procedures to include inside and top climbing, the employer shall comply with all manufacturer prohibitions, have a registered professional engineer verify that the host structure is strong enough to sustain the forces imposed through the braces, brace anchorages, and supporting floors. The employer shall also ensure that no part of the climbing procedure takes place when wind velocity at the crane superstructure exceeds the limit set by the manufacturer or qualified persons, or 20 miles per hour at the crane superstructure if no such limit has been set. The characteristics of the gusts should be considered for their effect on the climbing operation, and the operator of a hammerhead tower crane shall be present during climbing or telescoping operations. Operations shall not begin unless the operational aids are in proper working order, except where the employer meets the specified temporary alternative measures. In addition to those listed in 16.E.03, the following shall be provided. Note the general requirements as identified in section 16.E.03 for operational aids do not apply to tower cranes. The devices listed in this section are required on all tower cranes covered by this subpart unless otherwise specified. Rail clamps, if used, shall have slack between the point of attachment to the rail and the end fastened to the crane. The following shall also be provided. Hydraulic system pressure limiting device, the following brakes, which shall automatically set in the event of pressure loss or power failure, are required. Hoist brake on all hoists, swing brake, trolley brake, rail travel brake. A dead man control or forced neutral return control or hand levers. Emergency stop switch at the operator's station. Trolley travel limiting device that prevents trolley from running into the trolley end stops. The following shall also be provided. Ambient wind velocity device. This device shall be mounted at or near the top of the crane. A velocity readout shall be provided at the operator station in the cab. And a visible or audible alarm shall be triggered in the cab and at remote control stations when a preset wind velocity has been exceeded. A hoist line pull limiting device that limits lifted load. On job sites where more than one fixed jib or hammerhead tower crane is installed, the cranes shall be located such that no crane or its load may come in contact with the structure of another crane. Cranes are permitted to pass over one another. Tower cranes required to weather vane when out of service shall be installed with clearance for the boom or jib and superstructure to swing through a full 360 degree arc without striking any fixed object or other weather veining crane. The boom shall be taken in the attitude dictated by its wind area balance. Non weather veining booms or jibs shall be taken in the least favorable attitude. Traveling cranes shall also resist 
Design wind level induced sliding. For floating cranes, section 16.L.04, land load handling equipment or derricks mounted on barges, pontoons, or other means of flotation shall be designed in accordance with the requirements of 46 CFR 173.005 through 173.025. A naval architectural analysis is to be done to determine allowable loads and radii. Floating service load charts must be posted in the cab or operator station and the operator's manual on board. Derricks must be secured to the deck and cranes blocked or secured. The following images provide some examples of floating cranes. For overhead and gantry cranes, the rated load must be marked on the sides and hoist to be seen from the floor. Section 16.M.04 warning device requires that except for floor mounted cranes, an alarm or other effective warning signal shall be provided for each crane equipped with a power traveling mechanism. For monorails and underhung cranes, they shall be constructed and installed per crane manufacturers in ANC ASME B30.11. The rated load of the crane shall be plainly marked on the side and load blocks legible from the floor. Load handling operations from Rotocraft shall include the following. Daily briefs, safe tagline lengths, sleeves and eyes to prevent load spinning, emergency hook releases, eye protection, hard hats secured by chin straps. Also, load handling operations from Rotocraft shall include the following. No loose fitting clothing, safe access standoff distance, 50 feet safety distance, and no work under, hook, unhook, or to position the loads. The following images provide examples of handling loads suspended from rotocraft. For powered industrial trucks or telehandlers, this equipment is only allowed to raise or hoist personnel if allowed by the manufacturer. If these procedures are unavailable, you are prohibited from performing this function. Operations involving the use of powered industrial trucks and rigging to transport or hoist loads require different operator skills and considerations than the standard powered industrial truck operations performed with this equipment. The following images provide examples of powered industrial trucks and telehandlers. Pile driver equipment shall be outfitted with a positive and negative restraint device to prevent accidental hammer disengagement. For example, preventing the hammer from falling or uncontrolled rising out of the lead, as well as preventing contact with head blocks or sheaves if so equipped. The following shall also be required. Site specific safety plan. No standing under the kicker or spotter is allowed around 12 feet of the pile hammer. All employees kept clear when piling is being hoisted into the leads. The exception is where it is necessary for an employee to momentarily lean through the leads to guide a pile under the hammer. If it is not required that the pile hammer be blocked in the leads. The width of holes of floating pile drivers shall not be less than 45% of the height of the lead above the water. Additionally, a minimum weekly documented inspection of the pile driving leads shall be conducted. If found to be unsafe or whenever a deficiency that affects the safe use of pile driving leads is observed, they shall be immediately taken out of service and their use prohibited until unsafe conditions have been corrected. 
Swinging leads shall have fixed ladders or have bracing located such that its configuration will serve as adequate ladder rungs. Fixed leads shall have fixed ladders and if so equipped, the decked landings shall have guard rails, intermediate rails, and tow boards. Fixed ladders or stairs shall be provided for access to landings and head blocks. The following shows an example of both a dedicated pile driver and a crane supported pile driver. For hydraulic excavator, wheel, track, backhoe loaders used to transport or hoist loads, personnel shall not work in, pass under, or ride in the buckets or booms of excavators in operation. They may only be used to transport or hoist loads if allowed by equipment manufacturer. And excavators used with attachments such as drill rigs, pile driving equipment, etc. shall require training specific to that operation for the operator. The following image is an example of a prohibited personnel hoist practice. For crane supported personnel or work platforms, the crane manufacturer allows personnel lifting to occur or emergency lowering. The critical lift shall be designed by a registered professional engineer. The weight and load capacity must be marked. Wire rope and rigging hardware and hooks shall be capable of supporting without failure at least five times the maximum intended load. And adverse environmental conditions require the involvement of a qualified person to make those calls. Load line safety factor of 7 to 10 times and 1% crane level to not exceed 50% of the rated capacity of people or platform and rigging. Competent person attends a pre-lift meeting and the activity hazard analysis shall have the details and an unoccupied lift is conducted and then immediately prior to placement of workers. Competent person inspects and approves and proof tested to 125% prior to hoisting or any modification. The following provide examples of crane supported personnel work platforms. The following steps shall be implemented when using base mounted drum hoists to hoist personnel. An SOP shall be maintained for 12 months and then reviewed. An 8 to 1 safety factor for the hoist rope in accordance with ANSI A10.22. Weekly inspection documents shall be maintained for two years. Independent lifeline and full body harness required. Voice communications between hoist operator and each landing. And a minimum of two guide ropes shall be provided when using a cage. An unstable load, lack of communication, lack of training, and inadequate maintenance or inspection are major contributors to load handling mishaps. Operators or others working in the area can be victims to struck by and caught in injuries. Contact with power lines cause many mishaps. A competent person must inspect a crane regularly to ensure it is in proper order. Planning and training help reduce mishaps.